drive the children to the hospital. Okay, calm down, ma'am. Get your shot, Daniel too. Was shot in the back. Seven-year-old Cheryl was shot twice from behind and died on the way to the hospital. Uh, what we do know is that this suspect, Canel Brown, was in fact a federal informant. Federal informant. Federal informant. Canel Brown was born July 3rd of 1979 to a large family, having several other brothers and sisters. During his youth, and especially in high school, Brown was seen as a gifted athlete and became a standout star at his local high school's basketball program. While Brown may not have been poised for a starting position within the NBA, he definitely showed talent and a natural gift for athletics that could have taken him far in life. But life, as it sometimes does, has other plans for people, and Brown would take the wrong fork in the road. You see, during his teen years, Brown developed a serious drug addiction and many around him noted that his personality drastically shifted and changed during the following years. So much so that this addiction would lead to his arrest on several occasions. His first major crossing with police came in 1997 when Brown was arrested for assault with a weapon and convicted for it serving about a year in prison. After his release in 1998, Brown would quickly find himself in more trouble for the illegal possession of a firearm. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to four years, but before he could carry out said sentence, he was once again arrested for illegal possession of a taser as well as trying to sell it. He took a deal in order to have those charges dropped and in turn, he would work as a prison informant. Later, sometime in the year 2000, Brown was arrested once again for possession of drugs with the intent to sell. He was released when he turned over information on a number of other crimes that had been carried out in the community. This seemed to be a pattern for Brown. He would get arrested for a crime, then turn informant or turn over evidence on larger crimes by others. He would then get released with a slap on the wrist and begin the cycle all over again. But this cycle would come to an end in 2001, when Brown was involved in a car accident where a person lost their life and another was severely injured. Brown tried to leave the scene, but was later captured and charged with second degree murder among several other lesser charges that he would not be able to escape from. Brown would be convicted and end up serving 10 years for those crimes. He would eventually be paroled in 2010, and where many would see this as an opportunity at a fresh start, a chance to make a positive impact with one's life, Brown went right back to old habits. And unfortunately, so did the police. You see, in 2014, Brown was arrested for the illegal possession of a weapon, but things would be a little different this time around. You see, during his time being held by police, Brown would begin to refer to himself by the name of his dead brother. He would also go on to tell police that he was suffering from mental issues and an undiagnosed mental disorder. Agents with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the ATF, 
would then recruit Brown to go work as an informant for them for the next several years, instead of getting him any sort of help, as he was apparently too valuable to lose. During the following years, Brown would be arrested over and over again, once even being sentenced to life in prison, a charge that was overturned thanks to a Supreme Court decision and the constant intervention from the ATF. This pattern would continue for years. Brown would commit a crime or violate the terms of his parole, and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives would step in to keep him out of prison for any extended length of time in order to keep serving them as an informant. Brown would also see charges for drugs, drunk driving, and assault, but every single time would not see the inside of a jail cell for very long, thanks to intervention from the ATF and, at times even, the FBI. He even managed to escape a serious drunk driving charge after intervention from a Detroit police officer serving as part of a federal task force. Perhaps by now, Brown would eventually come to see himself as an untouchable. Maybe the years of drug and alcohol abuse with no repercussions affected the mental health problems that he claimed to have. We will never get answers to these questions, as Brown took his own life after going on a killing spree during the tail end of 2019 and into the early parts of 2020. Starting on December 7th of 2019, Brown would shoot and kill 31-year-old Lauren Hadigan, a move which would kick off six potential murders. In late January of 2020, Brown would visit some old friends, and at a small house party, he would get into some sort of altercation. It would be this altercation that led to the deaths of 52-year-old Kimberly Green and 48-year-old Dorian Patterson. He would also try and kill 44-year-old Clifton Smith, but would fail. Brown managed to flee the scene after this event. The injured Smith would alert the police, and a manhunt would begin, with Brown joining the most wanted list. But Brown would not lay low for long, as on February 18th, he would shoot and kill 49-year-old Garcias Woodyard as he attempted to rob the man. Only days later, Brown would strike yet again, this time taking the life of 41-year-old Amir Thaxton in his own store, robbing him and said store in the process. Two days after the murder, Brown would strike yet again, this time taking the life of 36-year-old Eugene Jennings, killing him while trying to steal a car. Brown would attempt to strike again shortly after at an adult bookstore, but was identified by two people who work there. Brown would try to flee the scene after being spotted, but police would block off several blocks in an attempt to rein him in. Brown tried to lose the police, moving from home to home, but was spotted by various residents leading police to close in on him. But Brown had one last death to his name, his own. Cornered, Brown attempted to kill himself by shooting himself in the head, but somehow Brown managed to survive that attempt, although 
he did lose consciousness in the process. Brown would never wake up from this, and while he remained alive for a number of days, he would eventually succumb to his injuries due to complications from the shooting. For us, we may never know the reasoning for Brown's actions those few short weeks, but we do know he had a pattern of serious crimes on his record that he built up for many years. Becoming an informant kept him out of prison over and over again, and eventually this leniency would lead to the death of six people. Hopefully, those who lost their lives and their families can rest a little easier knowing Brown will never be able to take another life ever again. Thank you for listening and watching this episode of Case Files. If you liked what you saw and heard, the best thing you can do is like, comment, and subscribe, and be sure to share this video with your friends and family. Until we meet again, stay safe and never stop learning.